This is North Pod, a North Melbourne fan podcast, hosted by Jason Hunt. Nick Stevenson with his own moves. Cannington, North are in front. Hello and welcome back to North Pod. It's bye week, so we didn't lose this weekend, which is nice. Uh, although. Not sure if it's going to come across in my voice. It probably will. Uh, my health is about as good as the health of the North Melbourne Football Club at the moment. Uh, I got COVID, so I'm staying at home, but I'm pretty sniffly and feeling sorry for myself. So uh, some would say I'm very empathetic for the club's plight, uh, or you might say that I'm just a little unwell. Uh, so hopefully the, the sound quality is not too rubbish. You might expect me to be a little sniffly and a little bit nasally so if you're um if you're not down for that now's your time to to uh to bail this podcast is obviously going to be a little bit different uh no match to review and uh i actually had something else teed up that fell through as partly due to the COVID and uh partly due to a few other things so uh i've whipped together a few thoughts and i'm just going to sort of work my way through a bit of a mid-season review uh, nothing too serious, and then I guess touch on a few news points as well. So, no idea how long this is going to end up being, but that's the general gist. Before we get into the mid-season review stuff, uh, the, the major news piece from the week was Clarko getting into trouble for for allegedly swear. Well, he did swear for swearing and allegedly swearing in the direction of the umpires. Uh, there was talk that he was going to be suspended. Uh, but in the end, he was let off with a bit of a warning and he's not going to be coaching from the boundary again. Uh, I just, I'm not going to touch too much on it because it's not really a footy issue. It's not something that I feel like is super relevant to us supporters, uh, given that nothing came of it. Uh, but I do think it's a shame that he's not going to be able to coach from the bench from a, you know, from a coaching, from a teaching perspective. But the man does have history as a bit of an angry man. So it probably is for the best that, you know, given that, there's probably going to be a fair bit of reason for him to be angry over the next 10 or so weeks. It's probably a good place to, to not be. And per- perhaps when things are a little bit more positive, he could move back down to the bench. Um, yeah, I, I think, to be honest, I think we, we got pretty lucky on this one. I think we were very close to losing our coach for several weeks and we wouldn't have really had much to complain about, I don't think, in this. I know that you can say that, that this kind of thing happens all the time, but I, I do think the tide's turning on this kind of thing. Uh, And I think if they were able to prove that he was saying it directly at someone, I think this would have been the perfect way for the AFL to make an example of him. Uh, And I I really wouldn't argue with it too much, to be honest. I think, anyway, as I said, it's not a football issue. Um, So I I will move on. But uh, fortunately, we've gotten away with it, so to speak. And uh, Clarko will be able to coach for the rest of the year, so long as he behaves himself. The other major thing, I suppose, is it's a news thing, but also it's just a seasonal thing. Uh, the mid-season draft has happened, and we took two picks, I'm sure most of you would know, uh, because of the fact that we were bottom of the ladder, or are bottom of the ladder, we had the first pick in, the, for, in each round. Uh, we decided to take two players, slash we had two available spots, due to Coleman Jones and Goda being on the inactive list because they've got season-long injuries. So that allowed us to take two. Uh, we took Geordie Payne and Bryn Teekle with those selections. Uh, in case you're not aware, Geordie Payne is a bit of a, he's an all-rounder actually. He's a midfielder. He played back line in his draft year uh, and then this year has been playing as a forward slash mid. Uh, and it seems as though all the talk is that he was the consensus number one pick. We've been burned by the consensus number one pick in the past. We know that that was Jacob Edwards and we know how that turned out, but I suspect given he's not a not tall, he's more of a mid-sized player, uh, that there's probably a greater chance that he's going to turn into something. I do think it's important that whilst, you know, it's it's another way for us to add to our list, I, I really want North Melbourne fans and fans in general to set their expectations appropriately in that the guys that are getting picked up in the mid-season draft are either players that have been through the system and are looking for a second chance or players that just missed out on the draft um, six months or so ago and you know are potentially getting a shot now. And that's that's the case for Geordie Payne, who was overlooked at the draft last year. So, sure, showing some fantastic form this year, and that's why he's going pick one. But 
let's keep our expectations in check. This is not, you know, Colby McKercher impact that we're looking or expecting to see. That being said, he has played some footy with Colby McKercher and uh, won the best and fairest uh, at that club last year. So, Geordie Payne, I think it makes sense taking the consensus number one pick. You, you kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't on that one, I think, because if you don't take him and he ends up becoming a fantastic player, um, you'll never hear the end of it. Uh, but, yeah, I think it could be a solid pick. It looks as though we've selected him to be a midfield slash forward, in particular at small pressure tackling forward, which is something that we know we are missing. He's been kicking bags of three and four goals this year, and and his highlights definitely showcase his tackling capacity. He's not going to be a clean, crafty... You know, he's, he's a different type of player to those really high draft picks. His skills, I don't think, are going to be as clean, but I think it's the grunt work that we're going to expect from him. He's 184-odd, so he's not small, but he's certainly not large. Um, and yeah, I think there's definitely a chance that he finds his way into our, our forward line this year, given how dysfunctional it's been, particularly in terms of the tackling pressure. So Geordie Payne comes across. I definitely think he's a chance to play this year. Who knows if he's going to go through the midfield or be more of a stay-at-home forward. We have been playing mostly a smaller rotation of midfielders, so I suspect that he's more likely to play forward, but that remains to be seen. The other player we took was Bryn Teekle, who was someone that was kind of being thrown around as a potential pickup for us in the rookie draft or might have been the delisted free agent period at the end of last year. There was certainly some talk that we might select him. Uh, we've, we've picked him up now with pick 15, uh, which was our second pick. He's a 24-year-old Ruckman slash forward. He, he spent two years or a year and a half on the Port Adelaide list because they picked him up as a mid-season pick in 2022. Uh, He played six games and then he's been back playing VFL, I think, or certainly state leagues uh, uh, this year. So he he feels a need. We know that our tools, and in particular our our tall forwards, are a bit of an issue. I don't... I I certainly... My understanding is certainly that he's more of a ruck, uh, but I would imagine that maybe we're looking at him as someone that we could play as a second forward who then can go into the ruck and actually be a serviceable Ruckman as opposed to, you know, playing Larky or Toby Pink, these types through. Uh, you, you'd expect that Bryn Teekle at, at over 200 centimetres is, is going to be a better second Ruckman. Again, who knows if he plays this year or if he's a bit of a speculative pick. Um, given the fact that he's been at Port, played six games and been recycled, I, I think we have to set our expectations appropriately. Uh, there's every chance that he plays with Hamish Free and Taylor Goad and Finbar Maley in the VFL for the rest of the year, but he's another option. And I think if we did want to play a taller forward line that can mark it, I think that's his way in, to be honest. If he's able to mark it around the ground, uh, maybe snag four or five marks and kick a goal a game, uh, and then obviously give Sherry a chop out uh, in the middle of each quarter, I think there's a game for him there. I haven't I haven't seen much of him to be honest, so I, I can't speak to the fact that, you know, whether or not he's got any forward craft or anything like that. But I think his capacity to mark is the way into the game because that is something that we are lacking is a tool that can mark it. Our our mediums are supposed to be marking forwards, but they're they're not able to grab those marks on the wing or at half back. They're much better at marking uh, in the forward fifty, so that's that's his potentially his way into the into the game. I think into the side, um, yeah. But two picks, I'm I'm pretty happy with on face value. It's always hard. All of these players are playing well at, at VFL or state level or Coates Coates League level um, if they've been selected because that's why they um, have been selected. So it's it's hard to know if it's going to translate to the AFL. Part of me does wonder to what extent these guys are long term versus short term prospects. Uh, I know I'm not exactly sure on the rules. I know that last year when we got Robert Hansen, like he, you essentially get a contract for 18 months. So, so I assume it's the, the same uh, for these two that they they're there that they're on the list until the end of next year. Uh, look, I'm not sure. I'll be honest. I'll put my hand up for that one. But if that's the case, uh, someone like Bryn Teekle, you'd think we've got time to to have a look at him. Whereas Jordy Payne, I think, is probably the one that you you want to come in and see exactly what he looks like almost straight away um, at AFL level. So that's the mid-season draft. Um, nothing super, super, super exciting, but uh, some more players to play with and to experiment with in the second half of the year, which I think is definitely not something to complain about. In terms of the, the mid-season review, 
I guess just starting with how I felt about the season so far, I think in brainstorming about that, really the, the one word that I could come up with was deflated. Uh, it's It's been a really hard first half of the year to watch. The game against Frio was really the only game where there was a point in that match where it looked like we were going to win. Going into halftime or certainly late in the second quarter, it looked like we were, you know, we were in control of that game. Uh, we know how that game went, but that's the only game where we've really looked like we we're going to win. Uh, there's been other games where we're in it at halftime or where, you know, we're hanging around and just within touching distance before we get blown out. But really, that's the only game that we've played well for a patch where we've got ourselves a decent lead, uh, which is, yeah, it's tough. It's not unexpected, but it's been a really tough season, and I'm sure all of you listeners would, would feel the same way that, you know, it's really hard to stay positive and, and want to watch the football or go to the football when it's going like this. And, you know, f- far be it for me to tell you what to do with your time, but personally, I, I like to stay invested. And sure, I sit there on the couch or at the game in kind of sad silence a lot of the time, but. You know, we'll remember this this period, and that's I think what I try to remember is that's what all those Melbourne fans have talked about. Um, they remember the, those dark times when they won the premiership a couple of years ago. They were able to reflect, reflect back on that time and and remember that they had to go through that. I think Carlton's coming through that now. Like who knows if they're going to be able to translate that to to grand final success, but certainly. Had a really good season last year, and they're looking pretty good this year as well. So, yeah, I think we're at a really, really, really low ebb, um, and I, I think, I hope, and I, I'm fairly sure that this is as bad as it's going to get uh, because we've essentially shed all of our super experienced good players, uh, and now we just have to hope that we've picked enough good talent to, to start bringing us up the ladder in the coming years. Um you always think that you're bound to snatch one win, and it just hasn't happened yet. So hopefully that's not far away. We've got West Coast next week, so that's a possibility. But the fact that it's in Perth doesn't help. Uh, although it looks as though Harley Reid might be suspended, which you know doesn't do us doesn't do our chances um, any damage at all. So look, you never know. We've got the Weagles next week, and in the last four rounds, uh, three of those games are against the Hawks, the Eagles, and Richmond. So we just have to hang our, hang our hat on the fact that, you know, p- potentially we could snag one or two later in the year. Um, and you never know w- what can happen, particularly when um, teams are out of finals contention. I mean, that's how realistically we were able to get that win in the last round last year. Gold Coast kind of packed it in. And when when it starts to become the case where you're, you're not playing with as much edge because you're out of finals contention, potentially that's where we could snatch one as well. So... There's that real positive thinking coming through that we'll just hope to to prey on a side that's that's barely playing. But honestly, that that's where we're at this year. Our percentage is really poor. I was having a look at a couple of my predictions that I made in the very first uh, episode of this year, and uh, I'm not going to go through it right now. But there was a couple that, like the percentage one, where I really did think our percentage could potentially improve or at least stay where it is, and we've really taken a backward step this year, which is. You know, obviously hard. The other unfortunate and really disappointing thing from this year was just the way that it started with the the season-ending injuries to Goda and and CCJ. I think whilst they're obviously not super, super important, impactful players right now, I think, you know, Goda had potential to really go on with it this year and and cement a spot off half-back and on the wing. And and CCJ, I, I feel like this was his real chance to to show what he can do as that second tall forward. Uh, and whilst he had started the season really poorly, you know, he had the whole year ahead of him to try and develop into that role. So having those two go down, I think really just summarizes how the year's gone, really. Like a lot of hope you know, after that preseason win against Collingwood. And then really quickly, it, it fell apart, unfortunately. And I think we, we really haven't looked the same since we lost that game against Frio. We were, we were pretty competitive against the Giants and... The Frio game, that first half, you know, we're sitting there going, okay, maybe we've got something here. And then, lo and behold, it's it's really gone downhill since then. So that's the general vibes in the season. I think most of us would agree that it's been super disappointing and probably just varying levels of to what extent it was expected. Um, but certainly, I, I didn't think it would be quite this bad. I thought we'd be similar to last year, unfortunately, and that it just hasn't been the case. In terms of positives, um, player of the season so far. So if you're a regular listener, you'd be familiar with the North Podium uh, where I vote on the four best North Melbourne players from each game. And 
award them four three two one votes. Uh, currently, Sheezel leads on twenty one. LDU has 18, Sherry 17, they're a clear top three. And then Tom Powell 10, Charlie Combin 7, Paul Curtis and Colby McKercher 6 votes. So that's what the top seven looks like at the moment. Uh, Certainly in terms of those top three, I think it's really hard to argue that one of those three hasn't been the best. Uh, I think Shees has been the most consistent performer. Hasn't really had a bad game. He's had lots of games where he's getting two or three votes. Uh, and then when he was moved to the midfield, he had a couple of more quiet games, but then he's polled, but then he's polled votes, but then he's polled votes recently as a result of spending more time in that midfield uh, and coming to terms with, it, with what that role looks like. So yeah, I think he's been our most consistent, but I think LDU and Sherry have been better when they've been good. Uh, I know Sherry, I think, has had four, three or four best on ground performances. LDU's had a couple as well, uh, or certainly best North Melbourne player on the ground, because uh, usually the opposition has the best player on the ground, let's be honest. Uh, but LDU, I think, has been really good when he's been good. Uh, we know what he can do offensively, and he's he's brought a lot of that grunt work across several games this year. And Cherry's just been a real success story. I think he has absolutely thrived being the main ruckman uh, which is part of what makes me a bit nervous potentially about bringing someone like Tickle into the side because all of a sudden when you've got two rucks that can ruck, maybe you think about sharing the load a little bit more. But I think Sherry is exactly like Goldie in that he kind of thrives on, you know, rucking 90% of the game. So, yeah, he's been fantastic. We know that both with LDU and, and Sherry, they've got deficiencies. Uh, and I'm not going to touch on that right now because I've talked about it most of the year. But. I definitely think those three have been the best. I'd be stunned if those three weren't in the top five of the Sid Barker at this point in the season. Um, Tommy Powell had a really good start and has, has quietened in recent weeks, but as a young mid, you can you can forgive him. Uh, and then we know Charlie Combins come on in the back line. Uh, I'll talk about a few of these guys a little bit later on. So, yeah, I think those three have definitely been the best. And I guess it makes sense because I am the one that votes on the North Podium, so it does make sense that... Uh, my thinking aligns with with that top three. But yeah, I think it makes sense. And I think Sheezel has been consistently our, our best player and um, would be polling best and fairest votes in, in most weeks, I think. Got a couple of other talking points here. So best new player. So this could be a drafted player, someone who's traded in or a delisted free agent pickup. Uh, I've got two that I think could potentially fight it out. I think Colby McCurcher is the clear number one. Uh, our number one draft pick, drafted two last year. Uh, has been scintillating off halfback. Missed the last couple of games with a with a foot injury, so hoping that he's able to get his way back into the side as soon as possible. But he absolutely looks like he's going to be an AFL player. Uh, all of the comparisons that draft to him were that Zach Merritt role, and I can absolutely see that for him. He's got great outside speed. Uh, when he's running off halfback and taking some bounces, he looks fantastic. Uh, he's not afraid of biting off those tricky kicks that can potentially create um, some space and some options for for out his teammates. So, yeah, he's been fantastic, averaging 20.7 disposals, 4 marks, 1.7 tackles, and 370 metres gamed. And that takes into account the fact that in that Geelong game, he, he got injured and barely played. So it brings his averages down a little bit. Yeah, I think it's hard to argue with the fact that he's been our best new player and exactly what you want from a high draft pick, someone that can come in, have immediate impact, and um, and find a role. We've seen at times through the middle part of the year now, he's been rolling through the midfield a little bit, uh, which I think is great, but I would like to see him you know, mostly down back, like we saw with Shees last year. He's obviously not having the same level of impact as Shees did last year, which is absolutely fine, because I don't think anyone was ever going to. But I, I think... We've seen that, that last year, having that consistency and knowing exactly what role you're going to play most weeks was really helpful for Sheasel, and, and I hope that that's, that's helpful for McKercher too. So I think definitely he's that bright spark. He's that, that player that you know I would hope that most North fans are excited about because he's doing some fantastic stuff and is, is definitely going to be a player for us. The other one that I thought you know is, is competing with him is Zach Fisher. And he hasn't been as standout as McKercher. He obviously comes in with a different level of expectation, being traded ac- across from Carlton as a fringe player over there and someone who couldn't necessarily or wasn't able to make their best 23 come finals time last year. 
Um, I think the fact that he's in there in the back line with McKercher allows us to move Sheasel up the ground and and certainly brings that that drive and creativity that we're we're looking for out of the back half. Uh, his averages are slightly better than McKercher, twenty three point seven disposals per game. 5.7 marks, 370 meters gained. We've seen, you know, multiple times a game, he, he does get found out in defense, but um, brings a lot on offense. And yeah, I think he's he's a great prospect. He's that kind of player that we need to needed to find because um, he's he doesn't bring up our ceiling, but I think he raises our floor a little bit um, and gives us at least some consistency. We know what he's going to bring. I, I think he can be a little haphazard at times, but... Uh, his last month or so prior to the buy, I thought he was really coming to some good form. We know his numbers are going to be high because he's often taking the kickouts, but I do think whilst he's just punting it to the, the back flank at times, I also do think that he's, he's biting off some tricky kicks and, and trying to create in an area of the ground where it's, it's really hard to do that. So McKercher is no doubt our best recruit, uh, but I think Fisher is probably a little underrated. Uh, and because of his defensive deficiencies, probably you know, isn't quite as appreciated by by the the fans, which is fair enough. Welcome surprises this year, improvers, I guess, is this category. And I think this is probably something that we need to be thinking more about as fans and, and focusing on when things aren't going well. Got a couple of names here. I, I mentioned one of them earlier. Tommy Powell has really stepped up in the absence of Taron Thomas. Uh, when he's in the middle, he's looked great. He's also been able to go forward and kick a couple of goals, but... I don't think he has that forward craft necessarily. He's that midfielder that can be a bit inside, a bit outside. Got some, had some great clearance work and particularly early, early in the year was looking really good. Uh, I think he's been a little bit interrupted uh, second part of the year or second quarter of the year, I suppose. So hopefully he's able to find more of that, that first quarter of the year form as we, as we move on. But he's definitely improved and definitely taken on that kind of third or fourth midfielder role. We knew going into the year that he or Will Phil or Lazaro or some combination of them were going to have to step up and and he's definitely been the one to do that. So it's been a, a promising year for Tommy Powell and um, yeah, really pleased with what he's been able to bring. Paul Curtis is very similar in that his first quarter of the year was really strong. He was hitting the scoreboard, kicking goals, uh, marking it strongly. Uh, and he has he's tapered off a little bit in recent weeks. Uh, made some poor choices in recent weeks. He's still really trying, so nothing against his effort. Uh, but I, I just think that his form was better in the first part of the year. Uh, he also seems to have got a bit of the yips kicking-wise um, recently. So anyway, I'm, I'm supposed to be focusing on the positives. You know how it is. Uh, I, I, I think he's definitely taking a step. Last year, we, we saw at times he had a bit of the, the second-year blues, and I think he's taken a step forward this year. Um, and he's playing a really difficult role given that he's often asked to play as the deepest forward if Larky's playing further up the ground. That's a really hard role for a player of his size to be to be playing. And like I said, he's, he brings effort every week. I would love to see him tackle a little more and pressure a little more, uh, but his goal kicking's fantastic. His strength in the contest is fantastic. And he takes it on. He's got a lot of Cam Zerhar about him in that generally his first option is to go for a fend-off. I don't know if I want that to be his first option every time, but that's what we've seen from him. So I, I think he's taken a step forward. Charlie Combin, another easy one. He's really settled in down back after playing the first month or so in the VFL, playing a fantastic, a fantastic intercept game and, yeah, really developing just some consistency in his game. I, I know that there's debate about wh- where he ends up long-term, whether that's in the forward line or the back line, but I think for this year... I'm hoping that he stays mostly in the back line and, you know, we throw him around a little bit if if we're just experimenting within games uh, because he's been such a revelation. He's been it's, it's such an inspired move at the end of last year to, to make that call. So he's looked really fantastic down there and, um, yeah, just love, the, love having him play on instinct. I don't think that his defensive instincts or his defensive capabilities are fantastic uh, when he gets stuck in a one-on-one or he has to... You know, make a decision between different defender, different offensive players. I think he can make some, make some mistakes. But if he's just playing on instinct and you know trying to get to where the ball is because he he he's able to trust the rest of the defenders, he he looks really good. So Charlie Coleman's been fantastic. Tristan Sherrier, I touched on earlier. He's had a fantastic improvement this year and and really come on. 
Um, we know that Ruckman take a long time, and I, I think it's fantastic that he's been able to prove some haters wrong. Um, and Callan Dawson's the other one. It's just a bit tricky because he obviously got injured relatively early, but his start to the year looked like we might have something as, as a bit of a lockdown defender who's also capable of rebounding the ball. So I don't want to go early on him. Hopefully he's able to get back into the, to the AFL side and, and prove that he's still got that that growth, but yeah, hard to say when he, he got injured and missed the last six or miss a while. Actually, he's, he's always two weeks ago, two weeks away, according to the to the injury report. The next section here is the most disappointing for the year, and um, you know this is a bit of a case of how long do you have? Because as we know, there's been some super disappointing players. I'm not going to dwell on them, or I'm going to try not to, uh, but I think it's worth mentioning all of these players. Dylan Stevens was one that I was always a bit nervous about bringing him in because, sure, Sydney's got some fantastic players, but as a high draft pick like he was, there's always a bit of a... There's a reason why he's not getting a game because something hasn't come together. And we've seen in the first part of the year that, you know, he found it really, really difficult to find the ball. Uh, he wasn't clanger heavy necessarily. He wasn't making mistake after mistake, but he, he just wasn't able to do enough in terms of finding the ball. And there's a couple of moments defensively where he probably won his time again. So we really thought that, that him and in fact, the next person I'm going to talk about, were going to be locks on, on the wings. And it just, it has not panned out that way so far. There's certainly still time for things to change, whether it be this year or, or in future years, but um, it has not worked out how we, we might have hoped with Dylan Stevens. Bailey Scott is such an interesting one because, you know, we've seen the last couple of years he's played all of his best football off the wing. And at times this year, or at quite a lot this year, he's been playing off halfback. And it just, it, has, it hasn't been the same. I think the first part of his year was okay, but without being good. Uh, but at times over the past six or so weeks, he's he's been really disappointing, Bailey Scott, and that's been either through not being able to find the ball like Dylan Stevens, or finding a lot of the ball and, and turning it over a lot and making mistakes. So I would love to be able to get Bailey Scott back to the way that he's been playing the last couple of years, because we don't need players like that to be, you know, going backwards or what we want is those players be being brought forward, um, unfortunately. So, yeah, just a weird one with Bailey Scott. I do hope that it's it's temporary, and I hope that Clarko's got a plan for him uh, because it does look a little haphazard at the moment, uh, unfortunately. Liam Shields is an interesting one. He hasn't played every game, but if he's getting games, he needs to be really clean and reliable like he has been for most of his career. Uh, and last year, I thought he was. I, I haven't loved his, his work this year. He's been sloppy um, and, and quite, you know, making mistakes that I'd expect young players to be making. So if he if he continues like that, my preference would be that we just play an, a different younger player in there because we've got plenty of young players that can make simple mistakes like that. Um, look, I think like I said a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, I'm sure he brings a lot in terms of experience and, you know, a cool head for the young players. So... I think having him, having him around the club is not a bad thing, but I, I would just love to see him, yeah, be be better. <laughs> uh, to be to be direct, I'd love to see him be cleaner and, and more um, reliable when he's got the ball. Um, CCJ, I touched on, he really started the year rough and unfortunately got injured early, but um, he was not looking good in that early part of the year, and and no doubt an Achilles injury is not going to help his cause, which is really sad. Uh, Will Phil and Lazaro, I could probably lump them together. Lazaro's played as the sub a lot, and uh, as a result, it's been hard to for him to impact the games. Uh, just, just it's the same old story. He's not able to get into the midfield, and therefore he's not able to have the impact that he would like. Um, he's been playing mostly forward and wing, and, and not able to accumulate like he does at VFL level. And meanwhile, Wilfield's just found it hard to break into the side. Uh, played a couple of games, and in particular, that there was one down in Hobart where he had a shocker and got subbed out, uh, and hasn't been cited since. So, the two of them, I really thought that of that trio, including Powell, that that two of them would come on this year. We kn- we know that Lazaro had had a fantastic preseason. And, uh, yeah, neither of them have set the world on fire. In fact, they've both been disappointing, I would say, this year. Will Phil in particular, based on the fact that he's not able to get into the side and he was that that high draft pick. So not too sure what his future holds, but um, he's not doing himself any favours or the club any any favours this year. 
And finally, Cam Zerha, who I thought, you know, he's been up and down. I gave him a vote last game based on a really good half of football, uh, which was probably generous. I just, he's he's looking a little disinterested at times. He, he just seems to turn it off and on because he's certainly looked engaged and like he was trying his best last week. But there are, there are weeks where I just feel like, you know, he's, he's anonymous. He's not really impacting the game and... Unfortunately, he's a senior player right now. He's in that that age group that should be one of our best players every week, and, and he's not. So I'm not too sure what the future holds for him. Maybe a fresh start is sort of what he needs, but he's also in the age profile that I don't really know that we can be afford to lose. Yeah, it's just one to watch as we move into the second half of the year because... You know, we were lucky to sign him for two years, I think, with, with Clarko coming in to, to coach. I think there's a good chance that he would have gone elsewhere if that wasn't the case. He's now getting himself to free agency, and I could absolutely see him, you know, heading on back to Perth or, or moving to another Melbourne club um, at the end of the season. So I hope that his form picks up and therefore he wants to stay and he can see the green shoots. Uh, but, yeah, it hasn't been a fantastic start to the year or first half of the year. For Cam, in terms of players whose development I, I'm going to be tracking closely in the second half of the year, uh, Curtis Taylor is one, not because he's super young, but more so because I'm going to be interested to see if he's going to stick around at the year's end. Uh, he's played the last couple of games, but prior to that, wasn't getting a game, so he's one that I'm interested in. Uh, Wardlaw, I'm just hoping to see you know, more consistency from him and he's able to just get involved slightly more in games, accumulate a little bit more. Uh, I've, I've talked about it before. I, I don't expect him to be a 30 possession plus player, but I do think he needs to be getting it more than 16, 17 times. Uh, Zane Dersmer, I think, is in a really impossible position playing that that high half forward role in, in this side at the moment. So to be honest, I'd love to see him a bit more at VFL level, getting his hands on the footy, getting involved and, you know, sort of developing that way so that when we are a better side, he can impact it more. Uh, but I'll be watching him because we know that we want a bit more defensively from him. Uh, Will, Phil and Lazara, I really just talked about, so I'm looking to see if they can respond in the second half of the year. Uh, and the small forwards is the other spot. Harvey, Drury, Hanson Jr., can any of them, you know, c- cement a spot in the side is... Is, is the question going into the second part of the year because we've seen a bit of jewellery. We haven't seen Cooper Harvey due to injury uh, or and form, and we haven't seen Hanson Jr. due to form. So, yeah, I just wonder if any of those three can, can really eke out a spot in this side because I, I do definitely think there's a spot for someone who could grab that opportunity with, with both hands. Maybe that's going to be Geordie Payne. Who knows? But I, I wonder if one of those three might find their way into the side. Last thing, in terms of my expectations for the rest of the year, uh, honestly, from here on out, I'm just hoping for a couple of wins. Um, As I said, there's a patch at the end of of the season where we've got some winnable games, but we just need to pinch one or two. I think two from here would be satisfactory. I'm not going to say good because, you know, obviously that's not good. Uh, but two from here would be better than what we've got right now. And obviously, we just want to keep see, seeing development, particularly from the young players. We want to see McKercher and Wardlaw and Dersma and Sheasel. We want to see these players developing and, you know, blossoming, so to speak. And even if that means that individually they're having, having great games, but the side's not playing super well, uh, I think that's what we want to see. Uh, we can, you know, build on that in in the future. So... I know it's dire to say that, you know, I'm hoping for two wins. I certainly was hoping for, for more than that at the start of the year, but given we've, we're at this point and we're winless and we haven't really won, you know, we've won one game since round two of last year, it's it's hard to see us winning much more than one or two games for the rest of the year. God help us if we don't win one. Uh, I, I know that, you know, all the talk is you've got to win one eventually and I'm a firm believer in that. My dad always said, every loss brings you closer to your next win, and every win brings them closer to the next loss. But uh, there, there is a bit of a feeling that we could lose for forever at this point, just based on how we're playing and who's out in the park. So hopefully that's not the case. Yeah, two wins would be great. If we could beat West Coast at home and, and maybe beat Richmond or Hawthorne, that'd be fantastic. Or if we can you know, even win one of those and then and steal one against a side that's just fallen out of finals contention, um, something like that would be fantastic because we just need a couple of wins. We need these players that have, haven't experienced a win or have barely experienced a win to just 
get a taste for it so they, they've got an idea of what, what, what winning looks like and how it feels because there are so many players on this list now. In fact, the majority of the players on this list that have barely won games of AFL football. Um, it's it's really sad, actually, for, for, the, for the players more than anything else um, because I've said it before, we as fans obviously hate it, uh, but the, the players live that more than we do, or most of them do at least, the, the players that care, which I, I do believe is most players. That is going to do it for this week. Um, my voice is starting to fail me. Hopefully this novel coronavirus hasn't been too much of a burden, and when I'm listening back to it, I'm hoping that's not going to sound as awful as it feels to talk. It's It's been a bit of a struggle, so I do thank you if you've made it this far, uh, and I do apologize for what my voice, I'm sure, sounds like. I'll be back with a relatively regular episode next week. As I said, we've got West Coast over in Perth, so we'll we'll review that game next week, and hopefully I'm feeling 100%, and hopefully we're talking about a win uh, because no Harley Reid, no West Coast, hey? That's that's the theory. Um, Hope everyone has a fantastic week and doesn't catch COVID like I've managed to, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll touch base at the end of next week's game. Go North. Thanks for listening to another episode of North Pod. If you give me a rating or review on your podcast service, that would be much appreciated. And please follow me on all social media at North Pod Show. I'm on X or Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and I'm also very active on the North Melbourne subreddit. Hope you'll join me for the next episode.